as co-moderator of this section, and so it's my privilege to introduce uh, Jeff Hastings. Uh, Jeff is assistant professor of medicine at UT Southwestern, and also is uh, a very prolific cardiologist at the uh, Dallas VA Medi Medical Center. He serves on the wards, he serves in the clinics, he serves in the CCU, he's an expert imager, he works with us on the TAVR team, and he's also the deputy assistant chief of staff of the VA. And he is exhibit A of why you want someone who's on the front lines working in the administration of things, because they really can get things done for you there. It's been very helpful. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I do, I, I want to pause for a second. I want to add something. Dr. Schmas said some very nice words about Subash Banerjee. I want to add that I think Subash has also been a great mentor. Uh, I did email that to his wife, and she sent it back to me. <laughs> that's probably part of why my talk has been reduced to 10 minutes. <laughs> so, so I'm going to talk about some imaging issues today, and it's more a show and tell than anything else. So I have no disclosures. I'm going to talk about access, some various issues, things to think about. We're going to talk about echocardiography, mostly TE and CT, but a little bit of 2D echocardiography. And we're going to talk about aortic regurgitation and paragogy of the week. Some of these are things that Mike already touched on in, in his tavern talk. And so I'm also going to try to make these case-based. So our first case is an 82-year-old male. It's class 4 heart failure. And prior left iliac stent, right iliac stenosis, so significant peripheral vascular disease. AFib is a low EF and has low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis, proven by a debutamine challenge in the cath lab. So proven to be severe aortic stenosis. He was one of the early cases we did, um, or worked up, the first or second, I think. And, oh, skipped it, sorry. I'm too excited on the buttons. There we go. So peripheral angiogram, because our cath lab likes to look at the peripheral angiograms for sure, even though we're going to do a CT. But we can see there's a left iliac stent we knew about. There's some uh, really osteal right, uh, common iliac, and some... Uh, external iliac disease farther down, but the CT, so this is a CTA of the patient that's going to cut down to the vascular and the bones, and then I'm going to remove the bones from the picture. And so we see the aortic tree and the art arteries below it. The white is all calcium in the picture. I'm going to make the picture rotate a little bit so you can see it. I'm actually going to do it twice. So you can see how much calcium there is in this patient. You know, and for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, kind of the dividing lines, the aorta above the iliac bifurcation, the common iliac, the internal and external iliacs, below the inferior epigastric artery, the common femoral, and then, uh, as Supash talked about earlier, the superficial femoral artery there. So in measurements then, we, in the CT, can look at the artery specifically. This is his right uh, artery from the iliac bifurcation, so this is aorta, all the way down to the femoral head, middle of the femoral head. So this is common femoral. Below the inferior epigastric, we mark, and we mark the iliac bifurcation and make measurements in between. These two images are the same artery taken in an orthogonal plane, so you're looking at it from two different directions. And as we saw before, there's a lot of calcification. We make measurements looking for calcification that's circumferential or horseshoe-shaped or mild calcification that's spots of calcification around. And in this patient, again, it's osteal common iliac, right common iliac, severe calcification, so circumferential. It was a very small 4.3 millimeter, um, pretty small, and at the time it was an early case, we didn't want to go through the iliac stent on the left side. So what did we do for this patient? Felt like we couldn't do transfemoral access. Um, options then, transaortic, coming from the top through a small sternotomy, maybe um, right side of the sternum, transapical, a retroperitoneal iliac, all surgical uh, access for these. This would be putting a conduit down to the iliac or potentially even to the aorta. Transoclavian is an option. Transaxillary, those over here for the hemodynamic talk last night saw a lot of transaxillary with pillows. Some places even doing transcarotid access for these. Well, I'll say this is a patient we ended up sending to UT Southwestern for Transapical access, the patient did very well for the case. Uh, being one of our early cases, we weren't yet prepared to do transapical uh, implants at the VA. Now, there are 
three registries, registries looking at almost 12,000 patients, and in those registries, about 75% of the cases were transfemoral access. So it's the most common. It's, it's fairly easy. We're lucky to have a vascular surgery service that works very closely with our heart team, really a part of our heart team, that helps us with this evaluation with this access. But the second case I want to talk about, which is the most recent, one of the two most recent cases we've done, is a 60-year-old male, has some heart failure, peripheral arterial disease with bilateral bypasses, severe COPD, it's not a surgical candidate, his CT scan uh, here on the right side, so I'm going to show you the right, that has moderate disease is the worst. He does have a filling defect in the right common iliac. Actually has two of them, but has a average diameter of 5.5 millimeters and the smallest of 3.7. This is what it looks like in axial, an axial view where that smallest diameter is. And it's probably a little undermeasured from the balloon of the calcium, but you know, given discussion with our vascular team and our experience now of doing these, we decided to go ahead and do this patient transfemoral. In part because transfemoral cases have a lower mortality. So um, uh, there's a review of cases. Uh, it's a meta analysis, it's 49 studies, about 16,000 patients. And in those getting transfemoral access, it's an improved 30 year mortality and an improved one year mortality. This patient got a device implanted, he had a core valve implanted through the right leg, it went beautifully, no, no access problems with the leg, and he's done very well since. So I'm gonna move on to transesophageal echo and CT. And I wanna start with giving you a little, just a little view, a little primer on the CT. We're not gonna go through how to make these measurements, that's a different talk in itself, and it takes a little bit of time. But you start with the basic CT and a reconstruction for, for 3D <coughs> imaging. And in the 3D imaging, you had a 3D heart, you can break it into three planes. And you set those then, so you have an axial plane that's along the aorta, or along the valve. Eventually this will be the annulus. And the other two planes, you can do this different ways, but the way I've done it here to show is I've set one plane, the red one, to go from the right coronary sinus to the non-coronary sinus, and that's this line. So the right coronary sinus here, non-coronary sinus here. And then the left, the blue plane, it's going from the right coronary sinus to the left coronary sinus, right coronary sinus here, left coronary sinus here. And what I really want to point out is I'm high enough above the annulus that I'm cutting through the coronary sinuses. You see a little bit peeking out below the lines, and we can see the sinuses around the aorta there. So once it's lined up, and there's a lot of back and forth and making adjustments, bring the plane down to the annulus, just so that the sinuses all disappear in the image. And then that's your annulus. You have to make sure it looks right, but we can see in the planes here, right at the lowest point of the sinuses where they each touch the heart. So we're moving the lines there to see, but we get a, get a measurement from that. So now we're gonna move to a case, go through the pictures. So a 76-year-old male, bypass, is a vascular path, had bypass surgery, had peripheral arterial disease, had stents, had stroke, uh, said he could only walk, walk one lap around Walmart. Used to walk four or five laps, so not doing as well as he used to. That's an echo that shows severe ES. So in the measurements for the echo, sorry, I'm still hitting the button too fast. There we go. And he's got an aortic valve here. This is a long axis personal image. This is left ventricle, mitral valve. This is an aortic valve and aorta. A little bit of a fuzzy picture, but he's got a heavily calcified aortic valve, not moving very well. We can freeze the picture, we can make a measurement. It's the LV outflow tract diameter. This is what we use for aortic valve, cal aortic valve calculations to look for aortic stenosis, measured at 2.1 centimeters. But then we can do transesophageal echo on this patient. We get nice three dimensional pictures. We can break that up into planes very similar to the CT images. We can freeze that. We try to line it up with the bottom of the sinuses, which is a little more complicated than the CT1, and obviously the images aren't as pretty. But we can measure an annulus there. And in a minute, I'm going to give you the list of all three together, so you don't have to read the little numbers on the screen. And then we do a CT in this patient. So all three of these, the 2D, the 3D, the CT, are all the same patient here. 
But we've gone through, we've made the measurement, and we have the CT imaging. So if we look at all three, from the transthoracic, we have 21, sorry, it's 21 millimeters. The 3D TE, we have a maximum and minimum diameter. So notice the minimum is about what the 2D was. And that's often the case because the, the annulus, anterior to posterior in the body, is often a little bit squashed, a little more uh, eccentric and flattened in that AP direction. So often shorter here and longer across. With an area of 4.2, and same for the CT. You know, same minimum diameter, but larger is a little bigger and the area is a little bigger. So what do we do with this information? We have a system that's built into our database we use for evaluating the TAVR patients. You saw one of these graphs earlier when Dr. Grode presented it, but it shows the color bars are the appropriate sizing, the appropriate areas for those size valves. For example, the Sabian's valve, the 26 valve, the TEE should fall in this range and the CT should fall in this range. Similar numbers here for the core valve. I don't show the perimeter on these. The core valve is typically sized by perimeter uh, using area and diameter as well. And so this patient that we talked about, here's his information. His CT falls into this block. His TEE falls into this block, which is a 26 sapiens valve. This patient ends up getting a sapiens valve. And so what does that mean for us? Well, if we pick a 26, the size of the 26 valve is about 5.3 centimeters squared, bigger than the 4.3 we got from the CT, and it's oversized about 22%. We know that oversizing has some increased rupture risk, which I'll briefly talk about. The transthoracic echo was measured at 3.46 if we use that smallest diameter and calculate an area from it. Well, that would mean we'd pick a 23 valve, and this would be the area size, which from what we get from the CT is actually undersized. And undersizing leads to significant risk of AI. So optimal is going to be about 5 to 10% oversizing for a balloon expandable valve. Self-expanding valves are a little different, and we'll come to that. So oversizing, we know there's risk. More than 20% oversizing in a balloon expanding valve is associated with rupture. And in comparison of sapien and core valve, those that are mildly oversized need more balloon dilation and lead to more stroke in what's the core valve here less balloon dilation in the balloon expanding valve, but those that are able to be vastly oversized actually do much better with the core valve, so less risk of rupture, where you don't want to drastically oversize a balloon expanding valve. There's undersizing issues also, so undersizing, the key point of the slide really is that looking at the transcatheter heart valve area, if it's less than 10% oversized, versus more than 10% oversized, there was a 19.1% chance of moderate to severe paravagular leak. So if you don't expand it enough, or size it big enough to meet the annulus, there may be a leak around it. There's some comparison of these that the area and average of 3DTE versus CT is about 0.45 difference, centimeters squared. And if we look from our own lab, we have 3DTE, this is in 24 patients, and CT, We've got a difference of about 0.43 centimeters squared, so we're pretty pleased with this. In part, we did TEs in all these patients because we wanted, if we had a patient that couldn't get a CT for renal reasons or other reasons, we wanted to be able to have the experience with TE that we could do the case through TE only. And then lastly, I'm going to talk briefly about aortic regurgitation and paravagular leak. The reason is that aortic regurgitation has worse outcomes in these patients. This is from the PARTNERS trial. There's also graphs here that show only paravalvular leak, but mostly this outcome is driven by paravalvular leak. But those with moderate to severe AI post-procedure uh, have a higher death rate than those with mild or none. So we want to prevent aortic regurgitation and paravalvular leak afterwards because it seems associated. Predictors, incomplete expansion of the valve, undersizing of the device, malpositioning of the valve. Here's a 92-year-old patient has a big chunk of calcium right in the annulus. So you know, his annulus is oval shaped and this rock here. If we look at that rock, it actually extends down into the LV alpha tract. So he has a little AI in the end, but I want to show you the valve also, which afterwards from the transthoracic echo, the valve itself, which should be round, is a little deformed here from that chunk of calcium. But with that, ends up with mild AI after the case. So looking at post-implant regurgitation, 
the issues are really looking at imaging modality. Mike talked about that some in the choice trial, timing of assessment, the valve system, and the grading scale used. Grading scales, you look at the angiogram as the seller's criteria. We can look at pressures. We can look at an aortic regurgitation index. We can look at a central AI versus periodovular regurgitation, which this hemodynamic measurement doesn't tell you. Echocardiographic. Um, the traditional color doctor measures aren't great for periodovular leak, but the percentage of the annulus arc is what's often been used. It's recommended as as the surgical prosthetic valve measurement, up to 20% for severe. But both the partner's trial and the VARC-2 recommendations are for a little bit different numbers for looking at severe. Should be 10 to 30 here. The VARC-2 endpoints, uh, as I showed, looking at the arc, I'm going to show you just a couple pictures of those, and then quantitative measures of aortic regurgitation. Picture of a sapiens valve that's placed, you can see the leaflets nicely. There's a little bit of aortic regurgitation around the valve. Change that to an X-plane image, which shows us two orthogonal planes, or can be orthogonal planes. And what we see is a little bit of aortic regurgitation here. This is a different patient than the one I just showed you. But just to give you an example, we can stop that picture, we can look at it, look at the annulus, we look at the arc of the annulus. This one's you know, probably 20%. So that patient was going to be mild AI. Another picture, this one's a core valve, where the last one's a sapiens. There's a little bit of aortic insufficiency here uh, that looks like it might be in the valve. It's probably paravalvular and would be mild. I'd say less than 10% for that one. The quantitative measurements, I think everybody who, who reads echocardiograms probably knows these extremely well, uh, but it's examples there if anybody wants to look at it. So it'll be in the syllabus. And then you know, there is some, in, some variable incidence in TAB or moderate to severe regurgitation after implant. And it's 12 to 20% depending on the valve type that goes in. This is where the choice trial is helpful. Gives, as Mike showed, drastically different numbers for angiography, not so different for ultrasound. And 30 days after, they stay somewhat similar, maybe a little worse, uh, especially for the self expanding valve. And MRI is similar to the angiography measures. The reprise trial, I just want to show this to lead into what comes into next. This is a lotus valve, something that's not commercially available now, but it has a, a um, membrane, a uh, cuff on the bottom of it to help reduce regurgitation. And after 30 days, the moderate, uh, mild, moderate, and severe regurgitation is less than baseline, a little worse than a discharge, but improves over the next 30 days. And so these are the different valves that we're kind of looking forward to in the future. A lot of different options that may change the way we place the valves, but you know it's about sizing and it's about location and placement, and getting those appropriate. So, thank you very much.